The Minor Profits for Beginners, that's the name of the course, Majoring in Minors, subheading. And we're at lesson number four in our series. And today we're going to talk about Joel and Amos are going to do two of the minor prophets. Before we get into it, I want to clarify some information concerning the order and the time and the object of each minor prophet's ministry, as well as how they are to be read, like the order in which to read them. Now, there are various opinions. If you look at different commentaries, there are different opinions among scholars, you know, which should be first or second, when so-and-so uh, carried out their ministry, during what era, so on and so forth. There are three possible periods that um, the minor prophets worked in, and here they are. Before the fall of the Northern Kingdom, 721 BC, so we had prophets working before the fall of the Northern Kingdom, obviously preaching to the Northern Kingdom about their unfaithfulness and uh, warning them about God's, uh, God's judgment. The second period, of course, is before the fall of the Southern Kingdom. But 150 years later, the same thing happened to the Southern Kingdom, it was overrun and uh, there were prophets working at that time as well. And then uh, a group of prophets also worked during the return from exile. Uh, when the Southern Kingdom was defeated, uh, they, uh, the Babylonians uh, brought uh, many of the people from the Southern Kingdom into exile. Uh, the 450 BC date is when uh, those exiles began to return to Jerusalem and to uh, Judea from Babylonian captivity. So as I said, I've read several commentaries that place Joel, because we're studying him today, uh, in the time before 721 BC, while others argue for his appearance during the Jewish return uh, from exile in the fifth century BC. You know, there's a debate going on. When did Joel serve? When did he work? You know, before 721 or in 450 BC, when did that happen? And they have arguments, you know, to support the views. I've chosen to follow the order that the books are arranged in, in the Hebrew Bible, or what we call the Old Testament, as the historical appearance of each prophet. The way they were listed in the Hebrew Bible, this is the way that we are listing them here for our study today. That means that Hosea, the first book listed in the group of 12, also a prophet who appeared before the Northern Kingdom fell in 721 BC. And so using this approach, the second prophet mentioned would also have lived and worked in and around this early date and not in the late period 450 BC, as some scholars have suggested. I mention this if you happen to have Bibles that have notes in them that mention that Joel uh, worked uh, during the 450 BC, realize that that's one scholar's opinion. My point is the Jews, uh, the Jews who uh, originally uh, put together the canon of the Old Testament, put the minor prophets in a particular order, the order that they're listed in our, in our Bibles. And I figure, well, you know, they lived at the time. Uh, they were much closer to that period or those periods. Uh, so we're, uh, I think we're a little safer if we follow uh, that uh, follow that order. I had another thought about that uh, the other day, and that was when Jesus uh, was preaching. When Jesus was on earth, uh, he was uh, using uh, the materials where these 12 prophets were listed as they are today in our Bible. So if it's good enough for Jesus, it'll be good enough for us to follow that, uh, particular, uh, that particular list. Okay, another feature of the uh, minor prophets is that in the Hebrew Bible, all 12 of these prophets are included in one single book and they're meant to be read in that way with each prophet being a single chapter of a book with 12 chapters. We have 12 different books. In the Hebrew Bible, there's only one book with 12 uh, chapters. 
Aaron Ventura, who writes in his overview of Joel, says the following, and I quote, often a book will begin by picking up where the previous one left off. For example, Joel ends his book with, uh, and he quotes, for the Lord dwells in Zion, Joel 3.21. And Amos, the next prophet, begins with, the Lord roars from Zion, Amos chapter one, verse two. So we uh, see here an example, one prophet finishes his prophecies, his work, the next prophet picks up where this one left off and uh, continues. So our study will review the same elements in each book. For example, we'll look at the prophet himself, his time, the message that he gave, the order of his book, and the main lessons uh, that we can draw from it. However, if we keep in mind that all of these were designed to form one overall book, one message, we'll be able to keep an eye on the bigger picture and the main message that all 12 are uh, bringing us. All right, now in our last lesson, we studied the first of the minor prophets and that was Hosea and the unusual way that God made him act out in his own marriage and family life, the unfaithfulness of Israel or the Northern Kingdom in its relationship with God. Today's class, we're going to continue with the next two prophets that are listed, and those are Joel and Amos. So we begin with the, uh, the prophet Joel. His name uh, is a Hebrew word which means Yahweh is God or the Lord is God. He lived sometime before the key date of the fall of the Northern Kingdom, 721 BC, and he may have been a contemporary of Hosea, the prophet who preceded him and prophesied concerning the Northern Kingdom of Israel as well. However, Joel lived in the Southern Kingdom of Judah and his message was directed at the people of the Southern Kingdom. Not much is known about his occupation or his background or his calling as a prophet. Don't have a lot of information, certainly not internal evidence. When we say internal evidence, we mean information that's in the Bible itself. There's not a lot of information about him in the Bible itself. We know somewhat of the time of his uh, ministry. Uh, no information is given about a specific historical time or is any king mentioned, although it is supposed given his position in the list of the 12 that he lived during the reign of King Joash, 885 to 796 BC. It would make sense that Joel doesn't mention a king in his writings since at that time, Joash's grandmother, Athaliah, had crowned herself queen after having killed off all possible heirs to the throne. You'll note as we study uh, the minor prophets and the Old Testament in general, that when one king died and another king rose or took the position, one of the first things they would do would kill off, was to kill off any, any potential <laughs> Any, anyone who would threaten them, you know, uh, uh, obtaining and maintaining the throne was eliminated. Well, in this case, the queen eliminated, uh, eliminated all of the uh, potential suitors uh, to, the, uh, to the throne and she named herself the queen. However, Joash, her grandson, had survived uh, the coup and he was hidden and protected by the priests and other officials until he, as a legitimate descendant of King David, was crowned king when he was seven years old. So he was just a baby when this coup took place and this woman uh, took the uh, throne. Uh, he was hidden for several years and eventually he was crowned. This ended the reign and the life of his grandmother, Queen Athaliah, who had been the only woman to rule the Jewish people in history. Although Joash was formally crowned as king, because of his youth, the affairs of the Southern Kingdom were managed by the priests of the temple and other 
royal officials uh, uh, of the court until he could take full control. This may explain why Joel does not mention any king in his prophetic writings. You know, when we study Amos or Isaiah or any other of the prophets, they usually talk about the king who happens to be in power at the time to give us an idea of the time frame. But Joel doesn't mention any king. And my point is, it's probably because his time was uh, during the coup when the, uh, the, uh, the woman uh, Athaliah had taken uh, the, uh, the throne. Uh, Joel's prophetic uh, message. Joel's book focuses its prophetic judgment on the southern kingdom of Judah with frequent references to Zion, Zion and temple worship. Let's talk a little bit about this word Zion. We, we come up against it uh, quite often in the Old Testament. And we hear that word used today, Zion, Zionist. Zion, the root word for Zion is castle or highest point. The name of the Jebusite fortress that was captured by David in 2 Samuel 5 verses 6 to 9 and became the city of Jerusalem which contained the seat of military power because the royal throne was there but also spiritual power because the throne was there. David was very wise. He combined both of these things in the same city. Eventually, the term Zion was used as a metaphor for a place where the Lord protects his people from the evils of the world. Originally, it referred to the city, the high place where Jerusalem was. Eventually, it meant uh, God's protection of his people. The physical city of Jerusalem was symbolically referred to as Zion, the city of holiness, or Zion, the city of refuge. Because of its status, the Jews who lived in Jerusalem believed that it was impenetrable by enemies. One of the reasons that the Southern Kingdom, the kings and the people of the Southern Kingdom were so stubborn in listening to the prophets is because they couldn't believe that if you lived in Jerusalem, they couldn't believe that God would abandon Jerusalem. It was Zion, it was the high place, it was the castle, it was the place where God protected his people for, for centuries. It had this reputation uh, so ingrained in the minds and in the hearts of the people, even when the prophets came along and said, you better be careful, You're, you better change your ways. You know, God will punish you even if you live in Jerusalem, but they didn't, they didn't heed the warning. This also explains why the people of the Southern Kingdom did not heed the warnings of the prophets, thinking that God would never let Jerusalem, the holy city, the city of Zion, fall to uh, unbelievers, fall to Gentiles. In the present era, today, the term Zion or Zionist refers to the effort made to reclaim the ancient territory of biblical Israel and create a modern state on this ancient uh, territory. This was accomplished after World War II when the Allies repatriated Jewish refugees from Europe back to their original territory for, formerly known as Israel. You had a terrible war. You had millions and millions of people who were displaced, who were refugees. You had, of course, the, uh, the killing, the murdering of of the Jewish people from various nations. Uh, they say roughly six million Jewish people were killed. Many of them were refugees. Their countries didn't want them back. They didn't know where to go. They'd been displaced. And so after the war, uh, the allies, the countries that had won the war, Second World War, uh, chose to uh, send the, uh, these refugees, Jewish refugees, back to their ancient homeland of Israel. Why? Well, there was nothing there. <laughs> it was just a patch of land. It's not very big. If you ever notice how Israel is not very big, you know, it's 100 miles long, maybe 50 miles wide, 75 miles wide. It's not, it's not very long. It's not very big. 
and it was populated by nomads at the time. There was no great city there, there was no country there, there was no power source, no manufacturing, there was nothing. It was just the various nomad, nomadic tribes that lived there, uh, people of the land. And so uh, Zionists, uh, in today's language, a Zionist was someone who believed uh, that you could reestablish the Jewish state in the ancient homeland of Israel. And the Zionist movement, if you wish, was the movement to help the Jews repatriate back to that land and rebuild that land. I, I remember uh, when, when I visited there many years ago, our guide, his name was Itzak, uh, said, uh, uh, of course, uh, the Muslim neighbors around them uh, are very anxious you know, to take over Israel. They'd love for us to get lost and get out of here and take over uh, because it's wealthy now. There's farming and there's fruit trees and there's uh, industry and so on and so forth. But he says, but we built that. There was nothing here when we came. There was no farming here. The, the, uh, the Jews, the modern day Jews invented what's called drip farming, drip uh, irrigation. Uh, turning deserts into, into farmland. Uh, today um, in Israel, uh, the number one, well, number one industry is uh, diamond uh, cutting and diamond processing. Uh, after the war, uh, many of the Jews who were displaced were uh, diamond cutters and diamond processors in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, as it happened, as they were all brought back to Israel, you happened to have a lot of people who had experience in diamond cutting and diamond processing. So that became uh, an important industry in, uh, in, uh, in Israel. Uh, that's, that's the number one industry, believe it or not. The, the second industry is tourism, people visiting uh, the holy sites and so on and so forth. And the third is uh, farming, uh, uh, crops, uh, fruit, fruit and vegetables. You wouldn't think it, but uh, when you drive there, you see uh, hillsides filled with uh, you know, vineyards and orchards and uh, farming and so on and so forth. So agriculture is their, their third thing. Very rich, uh, very rich uh, country. And so, as we say, the term Zionist uh, today refers to the Jewish nationalism. If you're an, a Zionist, you're a Jewish nationalist. Uh, and uh, uh, you're, it's a modern political movement that believes that the best way to protect Jewish culture and religion is to maintain a strong Jewish nation settled in the biblical homeland of Israel. I mean, we could take up an hour talking about the debates and everything that's going on today, but that's not what our class is about. Uh, just a little bit of information about Zionism and where the original idea for this came. Let's talk a bit about uh, uh, Joel's preaching. Like many other prophets, Joel's preaching uh, uh, revolves around three main themes. First, God's judgment uh, on the people due to sin and unfaithfulness. I've told you before, it's not that they completely abandoned God and went and worshiped someone else. It's that they continued worshiping God as they had been taught. But in addition to that, they took on other gods, gods of the uh, pagan nations around them. That was the, that was the sin that they were guilty of. Also, the need to repent is a big part of Joel's uh, messages and a promise of blessings and restoration. In other words, if you repent, there'll be, there'll be blessed. If you don't, there'll be punishment. But if you do, God will bless you. God will restore you. The content of uh, uh, Joel's book uh, is the following. Uh, five uh, things. First, uh, it begins with a locust plague, you know, grasshoppers. Uh, and a famine uh, as a result. The, the grasshoppers eat everything, the locusts eat everything, and so they have no crops, and so there's a famine that follows. He begins actually by describing this devastating locust plague that struck the land of Judah. This has caused great destruction leading to famine and economic hardship. So when you begin reading it, this is not a vision that he has. He's talking about what actually has happened. Then, of course, uh, another part of his book, Call to Repentance. In response to this disaster, 
He calls on the nation to turn back to God with fasting and weeping in order to receive God's mercy and forgiveness. Basically suggesting that, yes, it was the grasshopper, it was the locusts that came in that ate everything, but this is something that God has done in order to get your attention. The third thing he talks about a lot is the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. Joel prophesizes about the day of the Lord, which refers to God's judgment which could uh, simultaneously refer to a present event or a near future event like the fall of the southern kingdom that would happen in a couple of hundred years or a far future event like in 70 AD, the destruction of Jerusalem. That was the day of the Lord. When, when you know, the locusts coming, that was the day of the Lord. The fall of the southern kingdom, that was the day of the Lord. The destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 AD, that was the day of the Lord. Or the end of the world when Jesus returns, that will be the day of the Lord. So that term day of the Lord is interchangeable and it means a judgment. It's sometimes a, a small judgment on one country, one people, sometimes a larger judgment on the world uh, in general. The flood, for example, that was the day of the Lord. Okay. Then of course he talks about the promise of restoration as do all the prophets. They always, they always uh, charge the, the nation with some kind of sin and want them to repent, but they always promise a restoration. Along with a warning of judgment, there is also a promise of both physical and spiritual blessings for those who repent. And then he talks about something interesting he talks about the outpouring of the Spirit. And we're going to read a passage here from Joel chapter two, verses 28 to 32. It says, it will come about after this that I will pour out my Spirit on all mankind and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. So here, this is what we call a messianic prophecy. It promises that when the Messiah comes, everyone will have the spirit of God enabling them to lead holy lives and serve God, not only, occasion, not only the prophets, not only the kings, not only special servants would receive the spirit for a time, everyone would receive the spirit and everyone would have the spirit at all times. That was the great promise. The great promise was not that sins would be forgiven. Sins were being forgiven through the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. No, the, the, the promise of the Old Testament, the promise was when the Messiah comes, he'll bring the spirit and he'll give it to everybody, not just to kings like King David, not just to prophets like Isaiah, but to old men and young men, to females, uh, to slaves, everybody, everybody will have the Holy Spirit. That was the great promise. That was the thing that uh, the people looked forward to uh, from, the, uh, from the prophets. So this prophecy right here, if you haven't recognized it by now, uh, Peter on Pentecost Sunday in Acts 2, 17 to 21, quotes this, he quotes this prophecy right here to explain the dynamic work of the Spirit, giving the apostles the right and the gift of speaking in different languages in order to preach the gospel to the many people from many nations gathered in Jerusalem on that day. So basically Peter quotes Joel and he says, you see what Joel was promising here that everybody would have the Spirit? Well, what we're doing, what the apostles are doing, speaking in tongues and signs and wonders, this is what Joel was saying, it's being fulfilled in us before your very eyes. 
and then he preaches the gospel and the people say, well, what should we do? And he says, well, uh, well then uh, each one of you uh, should uh, uh, repent and, 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 and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Everybody understood that idea because John the Baptist had been talking about that all the time. And then he says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Oh, wow. The fulfillment of Joel's prophecy would, would, was meaning that me and my wife and my uncle and my grandpa and our two slaves, <laughs> if we believe in Jesus, not only will our sins be forgiven, we also will have uh, the, Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit. So uh, Peter explained that the evidence of the Spirit empowering ordinary men was the fulfillment of Joel's uh, prophecy. Not that ordinary men, all of them could do miracles, but that ordinary men could have the spirit within them to help them live holy lives. If we learn anything about reading the Old Testament is that God would give them instructions in order how to be holy and clean and you know, live a good life. And what would they do? Well, they'd mess up immediately and it, over and over. And, and, and they saw miracles and they had, you know, God speak to them and they had the pillar of smoke and the pillar of uh, fire. You know, they were witnessing the miracles of God. And even with all of that, when push came to shove, they, they'd go back to their idols or they'd disobey or they'd go into some type of fornication or whatever. They couldn't live a holy life. Why? because they were, they were in sin. And so the giving of the spirit meant you now will be able to live a holy life. And Paul, Paul says in Romans uh, chapter eight, right? If by the power of the spirit, you're putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Well, you couldn't put to death the deeds of the flesh by the flesh. You needed the spirit to put to death the deeds of the flesh. And this was the fulfillment of the promise that God made to the people. All right, so Joel's book is outlined, if you were to outline it, uh, five parts to the book, the locust plague and the call to repentance, Joel chapter one, one to 20, the day of the Lord and the divine judgment, chapter two, one to 17, the promises of restoration and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we've just been talking about, chapter two, verses 18 to 32. The judgment on the nations and the final restoration, chapter three, one to 17. Remember I said sometimes the day of the Lord is very narrow, one nation, one country, one people. Sometimes it's wider. And uh, in uh, Joel's book, Joel goes about denouncing the nations that surround Israel for their uh, paganism and so on and so forth. They're going to have their day of the Lord, uh, according to Joel. And then the last part, the final deliverance and blessing for those who remain faithful to God, chapter three, verses 18 to 21. Couple of modern day lessons that we uh, can uh, draw from this. Try repentance, why don't you? <laughs> Try repentance, why don't you? The locust infestation, the broken economy, they were not only physical and natural difficulties, they were also an attention getter for people to examine their conscience. It was a way of, for God to say to the people, you mind trying repentance? Sometimes sickness and trouble are just challenges in life we have to meet and overcome like everybody else, we're just human. However, there are times when what's needed is not just quiet suffering, but rather a careful examination of our conscience and an honest review of our conduct to see if repentance on our part is in order. You know, when things are going badly and everything is falling apart and so on and so forth, of course, like you, I pray and I ask God, please help me do this and that. And I'm thinking maybe it's a, something I have to overcome. I have to persevere, it's a test, you know, but there comes a time when I also examine my own conscience and my heart. And I ask the Lord, is there something I'm doing that I need to stop doing? Or is there something that I've left undone that I need to do and you're using this to get my attention, 
That, that's a valid prayer, not in every case, but it's a valid prayer at times. It's not unheard of in this day and age that God permits trouble and thorns to force us to stop and review our thinking and conduct to see if some repentance is, uh, is in order. So that's the first lesson. Try repentance for a change. Number two, Joel's hope is our hope today. The hope that Joel spoke of then is still our hope today. Everyone can attain the pouring forth of the Spirit today by obeying the very same gospel preached by Peter, right? In Acts 2.37 and 8. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit in every Christian is the agent who will raise us up to eternal life. Uh, I can't do miracles, I can't prophesy, and yet I have the Spirit. What good is the Spirit in me if I can't speak in tongues and if I can't heal the sick? Well, how about reading uh, Romans 8, 11, where Paul says, but if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, well, who's the one? The Holy Spirit is the one who rose Jesus from the dead. If he is in you, uh, then he will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who indwells you. Very simple. If the Spirit that was in Christ who raised him up from the dead, if he dwells in you, he'll do the same thing for you that he did for Jesus. That that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. The knowledge that we have the Spirit within us now that will ultimately raise us from the dead. How do we know? Well, we know because He raised Jesus from the dead. If He can raise Jesus from the dead, He can raise us from the dead. The Spirit in every Christian is able to do that. And then uh, one other lesson, God will make things right. In chapter three, Joel speaks of the judgment of the nations of that era that God would accomplish, especially of those people who had mistreated God's people in one way or another. This is a preview of the final judgment that God will perform at the end of the world when Jesus returns. We read in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God. And I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. So don't be dismayed by the seeming victory of evil over good in this world. Uh, don't be discouraged uh, when you see gross injustice or political corruption or public immorality and the celebration of all that is ungodly and unholy that you see every single day in the media. I mean, it's discouraging when you see it at times. God, through his prophets, promises that there will be a reckoning. There will be a reckoning. The destruction of both kingdoms after years of warning is the proof of God's judgment. Will God judge? Will he do what he said? Well, we have the proof in 721, he destroyed the Northern Kingdom. And then in 587, he destroyed the Southern Kingdom. Why? for the same type of things that we're doing today. Idolatry, immorality, uh, you know, exploitation of the poor and, and so on and so forth. So uh, let's not doubt uh, what the Bible says through uh, Joel. There will be a day of reckoning uh, and we as Christians need to be patient and wait for that time. In the meantime, uh, what is our task? To change the world? Nah. No, our task is to live holy lives. That's our task. And to call the people in the world out of the world into the kingdom. Okay. All right, so that's enough for Joel. While we have the time here, we need to talk about our brother Amos, Amos the prophet. His name comes from the Hebrew word amas, which signifies carrying a burden or carrying a load. 
The significance of Amos's name is that it was a reflection of his real life's mission of carrying the heavy burden of responsibility of delivering a challenging and significant message from God to the people, calling them to righteousness and accountability before God. Amos uh, was a shepherd and a farmer from Tekoa, um, a small town in the Southern Kingdom located uh, 10 miles uh, south of Jerusalem. His prophetic ministry was directed at the Northern Kingdom. So he lived in the South, but his preaching was for the Northern Kingdom, even though he lived and worked in the Southern Kingdom. During the time of Amos' ministry, 786 to 746 roughly, there were other prophets delivering messages to different regions and communities. For example, Hosea was speaking to the Northern Kingdom. Isaiah was speaking both to the Northern and the Southern Kingdom. Micah was speaking exclusively to the Southern Kingdom. Jonah uh, was a contemporary and he wasn't speaking to either the North or the South, he was speaking to Assyria and more specifically to the city of Nineveh. So Amos preached during the reign of Jeroboam II's rule over the Northern Kingdom and at that time, Uzziah was the king of the Southern Kingdom. Uh, Amos was not a trained teacher, nor did he come from a family or a line of prophets or priests. He describes his background and calling by God in the following verses in Amos chapter one. He says, the words of Amos, who was among the sheep herders from Tekoa, which he envisioned in visions concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Notice his visions concerning the north in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, the south, and in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, that's the king of the north, two years before the earthquake. Interesting uh, piece of information there. And then in uh, Amos uh, chapter seven, he says, then Amos replied to Amaziah, I am not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet, for I am a herdsman and a grower of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, go prophecy to my people Israel. A pretty daunting task uh, for a, a man who had no training uh, you know, in, in, in the prophet's work. He wasn't a rabbi, he wasn't the a priest uh, or the, a Levite or anything. He was a farmer and God says, I want you to go speak, not to your king, at least he'd be you know, in his own country. No, I want you to go speak to the king of the north. So uh, you know, a pretty daunting task. When did Amos live? He prophesied during the rule of Jeroboam II, which was a time, as I've mentioned before, of economic prosperity and military success for the Northern Kingdom. Jeroboam extended the borders of the Northern Kingdom, producing more agriculture and trade and taxes. You know, military victories weren't just military victories. If you gained land, well, that land could be used for agriculture or for, you know, for shepherding, for sheep, for cattle, for whatever. So uh, when you uh, won land, it meant that you were increasing your nation's capacity uh, economically. Uh, Israel also enjoyed a period of peace, which allowed for a focus on internal growth and development. The Northern Kingdom also benefited from many trade routes across its territory, which produced wealth and resources into the kingdom. Taxes, taxes. You know, a guy wants to go from the top of your country to the bottom of your country using the main road, taxes, you pay to, to cross the border, you pay toll tax and so on and so forth. So they were making a lot of money during that. And then Jeroboam had established alliances with other nations with, and fostered political uh, stability. One of the things that God had, uh, had against him, instead of trusting God, he trusted his alliances for military security. However, not all was well since this affluence was accompanied by social injustice, moral decay and unfaithfulness to the God of Israel, who had originally brought them out of Egyptian slavery and settled them in the prosperous land. So Amos spoke to a nation guilty of the following, social injustice, 
the rich were exploiting the poor and openly perverting justice, idolatry and false worship, Jeroboam maintained the worship of the golden calves at Bethel and Dan that had been set up by his father. The people continued to mix pagan religion practices with the worship of Yahweh. Luxurious lifestyles, the rich indulged themselves and ignored the needs of the poor. Uh, corruption and bribery, the legal system was compromised by bribes and perversions to uh, benefit the rich. Military success and complacency. The nation believed that their armies protected them without reference. Who needs God? We have military. We have a strong military. Who needs God? That, that, that was their attitude. Dishonest business practices, you know, false weights and measures to exploit customers. And of course, the refusal to repent. Despite the warnings of the prophets, the people continued in their sinful ways, refusing to turn back to God. So we have the uh, prophet's uh, message. In response to these moral, religious, and social evil, God chooses a simple shepherd and farmer from the south to prophesy against the sinful elites of the northern kingdom. Amos denounces social injustice, economic exploitation, religious idolatry, false worship, and the people's refusal to turn back to God. Despite warnings of a judgment to come, Amos presents a message of hope and of renewed relationships with God and blessings for those who sincerely turn back to God. Note again the three main themes in uh, Amos' uh, preaching. God's judgment due to sin, the need to repent, and then a promise of restoration and blessings for those who repent. It's always, you know, it's a different prophet, a different time, it's always kind of the same message, you know, pay attention, you're sinning, and if you repent, God will bless you. The prophet's book, Amos's book, if you want to chop that up or, you know, uh, break it down to its uh, pieces, again, five, five areas. Uh, the first one is uh, the introduction, Amos 1, 1 and 2, identifies Amos as a shepherd, establishes the historical context during the reign of Uzziah and Jeroboam. The uh, oracles against the nations, right? The judgment against the nations, uh, Amos 1, 3 to 2, 16. He pronounces judgments against neighboring nations, including Damascus and Gaza, Tyre, Edom, Ammon and Moab which highlights God's judgment on these nations for their sins. So it wasn't just the Northern Kingdom, it was the nations surrounding them that was receiving the message as well. Then there are the oracles against Israel itself, chapter three to chapter six, where he emphasizes Israel's special relationship with God and the responsibility that, you have a relationship with God, you have a responsibility. He condemns social justice and the oppression of the poor and corruption, and he warns of impending judgment and calls for repentance. The fourth part are visions of judgment. Amos receives a series of visions symbolizing God's judgment, including locusts, fire, a plumb line, like a measuring, God is going to measure you, okay? Um, and a basket of ripe fruit. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, opposes Amos and rejects his message. Then Amos prophesies the downfall of the religious sanctuaries and the exile of the people. And then the last section, future restoration. He concludes with a message of hope and restoration, promises the rebuilding of the fallen tent of David and agricultural abundance of the land. And he expresses God's faithfulness to his covenant. There are a couple of special features about Amos' uh, book and prophecy. It exhibits several distinctive features that set it apart within the prophetic literature. First, he, he emphasizes social justice. Amos is known for his strong emphasis on social justice. The famous phrase, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream, Amos 5.24, encapsulates his theme uh, about the need for social justice. It, it's not the so, uh, social warriors for today or the woke 
crowd for today, they didn't invent the idea of denouncing uh, social injustice. You know, thousands of years ago, uh, Amos the prophet, uh, prophet uh, denounced social injustice of, of the people. Also, the idea of universal accountability. Unlike some prophets who focus primarily on the chosen people of Israel or Judah, Amos extends his message of judgment to surrounding nations. He proclaims God's universal sovereignty and he holds all nations accountable for their actions. God will judge not just the Jews, he'll judge all of these other nations as well. Confrontation with religious institutions, that's also uh, unusual about his book. Amos confronts the religious institution of his time, particularly the sanctuaries in Bethel and Gilgal. He criticizes the people for engaging in empty ritual, uh, religious rituals while neglecting justice and righteousness. Then his background, Amos introduces himself as a shepherd from Tekoa, emphasizing his humble background. This distinguishes him from the professional prophets and priests of his time, and it underscores the idea that God can call individuals from any background to deliver his message. Uh, I am certainly a part of that group. Uh, never went to Church of Christ, uh, never, never attended Bible school in my life, never attended Bible camp in my life, never went to a Bible seminar in my life, uh, knew nothing about those things growing up as a, as a Catholic, my, completely foreign to me. The only thing I knew as a young Christian was that the Bible was God's word and I needed to obey it. That's all I knew. Everything else I had to learn from scratch. The whole culture, the culture of the church. If someone, if someone said to me when I was 21 years old, if someone said to me in, 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 uh, in 15 years, you're going to be a preacher for the church of Christ. I would not have understood what a preacher was and I would not have known what the church of Christ was. So God can take just about anybody and, and, and use that person in his service. And then finally, his dialogue with Amaziah, which I find fascinating. Uh, the book includes a unique dialogue between Amos and Amaziah, who was the priest at Bethel, you know, where they had the golden calves. He was a priest that worked there. Amaziah opposes Amos and he informs the king about his prophecies. And this interaction between them highlights the tension between the prophetic message and the religious establishment of the time. Uh, Amaziah, he was the one who was in the nice house. He was the one that you know, was the leader of the accepted religion. Amos was, he was a nobody, he was a farmer from the South. Who's gonna to listen to this guy? You know, so it's an interesting dialogue going on. Then a couple of lessons, each, each prophet, you know, we try to draw a couple of lessons as we finish out this morning. First of all, the commitment to social justice is not only for the politically minded. Amos's message highlight the importance of social justice in the eyes of God. Today, the call for justice and compassion remains relevant as individuals and societies, we can learn from Amos to actively address issues of inequality, poverty, and exploitation. We're not just about repent and be baptized. We're not just about make sure you come to services on a regular basis. We're also about justice for the poor, justice for those who are being exploited. We're also about that as well, or we need to be. Our goal as the church is not political, it's spiritual. We want to reveal Christ by serving our society as Christ served his. We have no miraculous power to feed 5,000 with a few loaves of bread and fish, but we can feed those in need, we can visit the sick, we can comfort those who are in sorrow, we can stand up for what is right, we can speak truth to power, we can do that. Second lesson. Authentic worship is confirmed by actual righteousness. Amos condemned empty religious rituals divorced from genuine righteousness and ethical living in the contemporary context. The lesson is clear. Authentic worship extends beyond rituals to encompass how we treat other people and live out our faith. What good is it that we have no instruments when we have public worship? What good is that if we're not treating other people uh, in a Christian manner, in a loving way? 
You know, that, that's, uh, our worship is worthless if we can't do that. An actual approach to righteousness involves ethical conduct, compassion, and a genuine concern for the well-being of other people. This challenges us to align our beliefs with our actions and to live out our faith in practical loving ways that prove in deeds our search for a maturing righteousness. People know that we're the people of God because we act like the people of God, not just in the church building, but at, in business or at the ball game or wherever. And then finally, we are responsible for the vulnerable. Matthew 25 you know, has the great judgment scene where the people say, Lord, Lord, when did, when, when did we see you, uh, you know, sick or without a home or in prison, you know, and what does he say? Yeah, to the degree you've done this to the least of, of these, you've done it to me. Amos directed his attention to the plight of the poor and the vulnerable, challenging individuals and societies to take responsibility for those who are marginalized and oppressed. Today, we tend to leave this work to secular charitable organizations who do good, but give no glory to God. The Red Cross gives no glory to God. The Red Feather Campaign gives no glory to God. The American Cancer Society gives no glory to God. They're all good associations. Uh, we, we can give to them. They're doing good work, but they give no glory to God. Only the church is involved in benevolent actions and gives glory to God. And that's what's supposed to be happening. The benevolence ministry of the church should be as dynamic as the evangelism or the worship ministry, because it's in this area of ministry that we put to the test the sincerity of our worship rituals and the truth of our message. And what good is it we spend $4 million building a big uh, building auditorium with a fancy stage and lots of lights and the, the latest uh, tech equipment and all this to worship God, but we don't have any food ministry. We have nothing to give the poor who knock on our door asking for help, for food. Well, 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 what good is all of that if we don't do the other? Uh, much better that we remain in a humble location uh, and put more effort and money into helping those who are poor and those who are disenfranchised. If God gave his son so that we might be saved, we should be able to give up much of our resources to lessen the pain of those who are suffering in this world. In this, God is glorified. And we also need to remember that God can and does use anyone in any way to glorify himself. All deeds done to those who are uh, poor or suffering in the name of Christ glorifies God, the smallest to the largest. A, a short visit, a note to paying their rent, buying them food, all of these things give glory to God and legitimize our, our worship. It's good that we worship according to the New Testament, but we also have to do benevolence according to the New Testament as well. They work together, these two things. Okay, that's our lesson for this morning. Homework, reread Joel and Amos, if you haven't. If you have, reread it, and now with this information, hopefully it'll be more meaningful for you. And then next week we're gonna do not two, but three Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah. Read those three, we're going to begin uh, Obadiah. Okay, that's our lesson for today. Thank you for your attention.